Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. We'll be preaching today from the first Peter reading, first Peter three, eighteen to twenty two. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we hear your word to us today, we pray that by your spirit you would bring us encouragement and preparation for times of suffering in our lives as your people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Imagine you belong to a relatively young Christian community and this Christian community is small, very much in a minority in the surrounding culture. Your Christian faith has meant that you can no longer rely on the support of your family. You and your fellow Christians are getting harassed by the local authorities in various ways. Employment and business prospects have become limited. In short, life is pretty tough. As one reads through the letter of 1 Peter, you get the feeling that he was writing into a situation something like this. We don't know exactly the details, but there's a lot in this letter which points us to the fact that it's written to Christian congregations going through hard times. People who are suffering for bearing the name of Christ. And so Peter's whole letter, and especially I'd say our little text today, is a word of encouragement to people in this suffering. And it can be for us too. If not to speak to the suffering we undergo as Christians right now, certainly to arm and prepare us for that possibility. So let's look at three ways in our text in which Peter does this. He brings encouragement in suffering. First, by pointing to the suffering of Christ. Second, by pointing to our baptism. And third, by pointing to the triumph over evil powers. First, Peter points us to the suffering of Christ. In our first verse, verse 18. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. So perhaps we can hear these early Christians saying in their struggles, why are we going through all these difficulties if we are God's people. Surely if we trust in God, if we try and live as he would have us live, we shouldn't have to suffer like this. And I get the feeling as you read their words in the context just before this that it's not just their experience of suffering itself, but it's that they can't see any meaning or purpose in this suffering. I can't imagine how any good could come of this. It's a very natural way of thinking for us human beings, isn't it? We feel like this at times. And so notice what Peter does first. He points them straight to the sufferings of Christ. Look to Christ, he says. He was the perfectly righteous one. He trusted in his Father above all things and yet he suffered. We see a similar dynamic in our Gospel reading today, in fact. Jesus' baptism and temptation. There is the Father's affirmation that he is the beloved Son, but then immediately the Spirit drives him out into the wilderness to be tempted and tested. So beloved sonship and testing go together there. We look to Christ, Peter says, and there we can find strength, even in just the simple fact that he has been through this first. When I was thinking about this, the picture that came to mind for me was bushwalking. Some of you I know enjoy bushwalking. It makes me think of those times when I'm walking perhaps through a very remote part of a national park and the difference between being on the well-worn track and being off the track. 
If you find yourself off the track, it can become very frightening very quickly. Every rock you trip over, every branch that scratches you hurts that bit more. But if you're on the well-worn track, no matter how remote you are and how wild your surroundings are, it's just a very different experience. Why is that? I think it's largely because you know that someone has been here before. Someone has taken this track ahead of you and when we look to the sufferings of Christ, we are to see that there is nothing we endure in this life that he hasn't first been through. You are not alone in your suffering. Christ is there with you. He's taken this track. But even more than this, when we look to the sufferings of Christ, we see the ultimate example of God having a purpose in and through suffering, of God bringing good out of evil. Because what does this suffering and death accomplish for us? It is for our sins the righteous for the unrighteous. It's in our place to bring us to God. How tempting it is in the midst of suffering to think that this means we are abandoned and forsaken by God. But Peter says no. Look to Christ's suffering. He suffered and died for you so that you would never be abandoned, never forsaken. There is strength even now in our suffering. Now this whole theme is a wonderful one to have at the beginning of Lent. Because one of the things the church has traditionally focused on during the season of Lent is the suffering and death of Christ. You might notice in our hymnal at the start there's actually no section for Lent as such. But there's a whole section on the passion of Christ his sufferings. We continue this tradition in our midweek services here by reading through and preaching on the accounts of Christ's suffering. Now why do we do all this? Why such an emphasis? Why deliberately and intentionally take time to meditate on Christ's suffering? We could say that It's the centre of our faith and it's the reason we know we have eternal life with God and that, of course, is true. But what this text also reminds us is that the suffering and death of Christ can bring us encouragement here and now, strength for our situations right now and so Peter points us to the suffering of Christ. Next... He points to our baptism and he does this by way of Noah's Ark and the flood. So after pointing to Christ's suffering, he moves on to talk about Jesus going to preach to the spirits in prison, which has something to do with disobedience in the days of Noah. This is a very challenging verse that we'll come back to later. But after this, he says, during the building of the ark in which a few, that is, eight people were saved through water. And baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So he gets us to think about the flood next. To think about those terribly destructive waters which came to wipe out the wickedness which had taken hold on earth. But also to think about how through those same waters God saved Noah and his family on the ark. As we said with the kids, water shows up all over the place in the scriptures. The water in creation the water of the flood, the water of the Red Sea and the Jordan, the Samaritan woman at the well and a lot more. And an aspect of water we're given to think about today is how water is life-giving and cleansing but also terribly destructive. 
he points us to the flood and Noah. And he says, first to remember that there were only eight people saved then. Why mention this size of the group? Perhaps because Peter's audience may feel like they are a small and insignificant community of Christians compared with the world around them. But this is often how it is for God's people. How small and insignificant Noah and his family must have felt. But then Peter goes on to say that in this mysterious way, the waters of the flood prefigure, they foreshadow, they anticipate, they point to baptism. Baptism now saves you. Not just on its own, but through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In other words, baptism is effective because we're baptised into the death and resurrection of Jesus, as Paul makes much about in Romans. Jesus dies and rises again to save us. He applies this salvation to us in baptism. An everyday picture of this connection might be something like this. If you fall off a boat in the ocean, someone might throw you one of those lifesaver rings and they pull you in and you're safe. And you say later on to one person, thank goodness that inflatable ring, that saved my life. But then you're talking to another person and you say, thank goodness for that person on the boat, they saved my life. And both are true. Baptism saves you through the resurrection of Jesus. But Peter also wants to point out that this salvation in baptism, it doesn't mean sin is completely and forever removed from our flesh in this life. He says it's not a removal of dirt from the body, rather it's to do with a good conscience, a clean heart. So being saved in baptism doesn't mean we never sin again, but it does mean that when we fail and when our conscience would condemn us, that in baptism Christ's blood sprinkled on our hearts now speaks a new word in our conscience, that you are forgiven that those sins are paid for, that your suffering is not a punishment for those sins. It's in this new reality we live and we live before God, before others, before ourselves with this good conscience. And what an encouragement that can be in the midst of suffering. Because suffering is one of those things which can wreak havoc in our conscience, which can give us this unsteadiness of heart. Whereas Peter says, in your baptism, you have the gift of a good conscience, a steady heart, in the midst of all that goes on around about. So first he points to the suffering of Christ, then to our baptism. And finally he points to the defeat, the triumph, over evil powers. So this comes up in the final verse. There's the mention of Christ's resurrection and then there's this, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels and authorities and powers made subject to him. This is something that we more commonly hear about, say, at the ascension of Christ that when Christ ascends into heaven at God's right hand, he is over all of the powers of evil. They're made subject to him. They're under his lordship and control. But there's also a connection in our text back to that verse that I skipped over earlier. When we read that Christ went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison who in former days did not obey when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark. Now this is a notoriously hard verse to really get a handle on. 
Who are these spirits? When and how did Christ go and preach to them? Are they human beings? Does it somehow refer to disobedient human beings from the time of Noah that heard a message from Christ in one way or another? Or could it refer to human beings more generally who become imprisoned to all sorts of things in life and how the message of Christ frees us from them? Or does it somehow connect with what we say in the Apostles' Creed that Christ descended into hell? I think all of these are possible actually. Another interpretation though is that this is somehow to do with fallen angels who may have been involved in that very strange incident that happened just before the flood. If you remember that, we won't go into it today but look it up in Genesis 6 if you're interested. The reason that it's possible to think about it in these terms is that in 2 Peter, again, we hear about Noah. And then we read this, that God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of deepest darkness. It seems like a bit of a parallel. And so if you take this line, when it says that Christ went and preached to the Spirit's in prison, it seems to be part of this victory march of Christ, if you like, that after his triumph in his death and resurrection, there's this victory march in which he announces this victory over evil throughout the spiritual realm, even to these fallen angels. Now, whether this is exactly what this verse means or not, Who knows? I really don't know. But that main point still stands. That to encourage God's people in the midst of suffering, Peter points us to the victory over all evil powers. The same thing we see in our Gospel reading today. Christ tempted by Satan but overcoming him. And again, to return to our context... How does this work as a word of encouragement to people as they suffer? Well, I think it's one thing to feel as if human beings in this world are out to get you. It's another thing to feel as if cosmic powers of darkness are threatening your life and security. And even if people today don't always express these sort of feelings in the same way the Bible speaks about the supernatural realm, It's fascinating how often we still do hear about powers and dynamics in our world which people feel are far too powerful. They're overwhelming. It can feel to many people as if chaos does reign in the world rather than any order or goodness, let alone God. And so Peter wants to bring a word of encouragement to Christians. Don't be deceived by the appearance of evil's triumph in this world. Christ has subjected all powers. He's proclaimed his victory even in hell itself. He's defeated the evil one and he's done it for you. Let the Spirit open the eyes of your faith to see this true picture of reality and be encouraged in all of your suffering. So for these young Christian churches, feeling harassed and helpless, suffering for their witness to Christ, Peter's letter comes as a word of encouragement, as it does for us. First, by encouraging us to look in faith to the sufferings of Christ for our sins which bring us to God. Second, by remembering our baptism which saves us and brings us this good conscience. Third, by proclaiming Christ's victory over all evil powers. So may God's Spirit bring this same encouragement to you in all the trials of life. In Jesus' name, Amen.